Well, I'm glad uh, to have tech support. No kidding. <laughs> this is great. It was a little, uh, a little awkward the way I was standing for the, <laughs> as the lights came up when I... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, it's all right. Uh, no, it's great. Hey, I'm glad uh, this morning that we've got Josh Howard and his family with us, Lashi and the kids. Uh, I, I wanted to introduce them to you, um, and, uh, and then we'll pray for Josh as he uh, gives our message today. He'll be preaching for us. Um, Josh uh, married up. Can I put it that way? He way, married, way up. He married up. Uh, by coming into uh, the Lal family. And so uh, Lashi is the daughter of Dr. Ajay and Indu Lal. These are our workers in central India that Northside has supported for a lot of years. And you're going to hear more about that here in just a little bit. But um, they uh, have worked together uh, in central India for 15 plus years. And uh, it's just been a joy for us to connect with them in that regard. But more specifically, in the last two years, uh, Northside has connected with Josh uh, because it was really uh, almost two years ago where you and I had connected over a Zoom meeting as you were talking to me about disciple-making movement practices, and we got about halfway through that conversation, and I went, I think I need to record this. Do you care if I record this? And then I'm going to send it on to Wayne. And I'm telling you, church, um, that God has used Josh and some other guys that were part of that Ignite uh, cohort to uh, really help carry us into what we believe is God's will for Northside and for Springfield, because we long to see a disciple-making movement take place in our community for the glory of Jesus' name. And uh, God used Josh in a very instrumental way for that. So I'm glad that he gets to share with you today out of Matthew chapter 28 on the Great Commission. Uh, and so uh, we're just going to pray for him. But know that whenever you give your offerings to the Lord as an act of worship, whether that's online um, or if you give it in the black boxes around the room, when that happens... Part of that gift goes to further kingdom work all over the globe, and that includes in central India to see disciple-making movements take place there, and as well as even here locally. And we're seeing it happen. We're hearing the stories. It's amazing. And uh, so I praise the Lord for you, Josh, and so Thank glad you. to call you brother and serve alongside in kingdom work with you. Church, let's join together in prayer. Can we okay. call them up for the prayer? Yes, by all means. If you would have the family come on up here, guys. Come, come on, on up we're here pray real quick so they the can see Lord's blessing you. over the entire Howard clan here. Come, come. All right. I want you guys to meet the family too, so that way you can see them. Come, guys. Come and actually, they, you guys got into Springfield Friday night, and uh, so uh, in your stateside visit here, and got to go to Fantastic Caverns yesterday, first time for the kids to be in a cave. So that's <laughs> kind of cool. And scary uh, at yeah. times, uh, hey. but cool. So this is Lashi. <laughs> And the kids here. So I just, yeah. I would love to pray the Lord's blessing over you all. Thank okay? you. Yeah. God, we are so honored to, um, uh, to be your children, to belong to you, that you put a name on us. It's your name. I want to thank you that you also uh, give us work to do and that we can pull up alongside of Jesus and we can do kingdom work we can make an impact. We can do our part. Thank you for the way that Josh and his family um, have faithfully been doing their part. I pray that you would continue to bless them to that end, that they would continue to be blessed with faithfulness. They would continue to be blessed with power to do hard work in a hard place. I also pray um, that you would guard them. And even as we'll hear in a little bit, um, you have not guarded them from all trouble, but you have been their guard through trouble. We pray that um, you would use them in such a powerful way that would glorify Christ in central India and give the devil fits. We pray that you would empower Josh right now for this good word, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would give us ears to hear that you would give us minds to understand and open our own eyes, that we would see that the fields are white, ready for a harvest. They're ready. We don't want to miss it. Thank you for this precious family. Thank you for the good things you're doing through them. Bless Josh now as he preaches, and we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Church, can we welcome this family today? Thank, thank you, guys. guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you, guys. Say thank you. <laughs> As Corey said, <clears throat> you can tell that I married way, way up 
I pretty regularly get people say, how did a guy like you get a girl like that? I don't know that that's a compliment. To me, it's a compliment to my wife. <laughs> but uh, I always say she's the Princess Jasmine, I'm the street rat Aladdin. That's just the way it goes. So um, kids, baby, so good to have you guys here. Love you and, and so thankful for all you guys. Um, so this morning, guys, before I get into the message, I really wanna give a quick update of what God has been doing in India. And, and let me tell you something, the, the last year has by far been the most difficult year um, that our ministry has ever seen. It's also been the most difficult year that our family has seen in the last 15 years since I've been there. But as we see all over the world and throughout church history, as persecution increases, the kingdom of God spreads more rapidly. And so we have seen the most fruitful year in the last year that we've ever seen as well. And so it's crazy how as one increases, the other also increases. Um, back in November and December, our family had to go underground for several weeks. Uh, my father-in-law, uh, my wife's dad, had a warrant out for his arrest. Uh, it was all false charges. It was because of his Christian faith. And they came against him and our family. And so we all had to go and move from place to place to place every couple of days. It was crazy. Um, but I was so proud of my kids, of my wife, just the way they went through that with boldness and strength. And um, it was a tough season. But by God's grace, uh, God protected us. As Corey said, uh, my father-in-law actually has a message that he preaches where he talks about how God did not save Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego from the fire, but he saved them in the fire. He didn't save Daniel from the lion's den, but while, they, while he was in the lion's den. He didn't save Peter and John from going to prison. He saved them while they were in prison. And we have encountered that as our family. He may not have saved us from going through the problems, but he saved us in the midst of them. And uh, it was unbelievable to see God's hand of protection and guidance through that season. And so I thank you for your prayers. Um, but let me tell you this, like I said, even though uh, we went through difficulty, we've also seen the most fruitful season of our lives. My wife leads a children's home in India. She started it when she was 20. I'm so proud of her. Uh, again, she's beautiful on the inside and, and out in, in incredible ways. Um, and so that's the work that she leads. About eight and a half years ago, I started a branch of our ministry called Ignites, where we really wanted to shift from addition to multiplication, a very similar journey to what you guys are going on as a church right now. So we knew that we wanted to see the whole nation reach with the gospel, and we desperately needed to see disciples who make disciples and churches that start churches. About eight and a half years ago, we launched that. And guys, in the last eight and a half years, I want you to hear this, and, and honestly, I can't even believe it myself, some of the numbers I'm gonna share with you right now. But in the last eight and a half years, we have now seen over 20,000 new churches started. New churches, 20,000 new churches. Like, <laughs> now, now they don't look like this. Uh, most of them are 15 to 20 people. Uh, they meet in homes, they meet under mango trees, they meet in little coffee shops and chai shops in India. Um, most of them are underground. They're, not, they're in very difficult areas, most of them. But God is using everyday, ordinary disciples, not just leaders and big church planners and seminary graduates, but everyday, ordinary people to plant churches and multiply disciples. Last year alone, in the most difficult season of our lives, we saw over 8,000 churches planted last year, just in 2022, and 53,000 people came to Jesus, 53,000 people. Now, now listen, I need to clarify something real quick, all right? It's very easy for a white guy on a stage in America to take credit for everything that God has done, okay? Let me be really clear with you, okay? I personally have not planted any of those churches. There are thousands of, of people that you'll never know their name, you'll never know their faces, everyday ordinary Indian believers that are risking their lives every day, being faithful disciples of Jesus, and I just get to, I, I get the honor of representing them in a place like this. And so I want you to know that God is using hundreds of thousands of these people 
to do extraordinary things. God reminds me all the time, he loves to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. Amen? My in-laws, Dr. Zajay and Indulal, they send their greetings. Uh, you guys have been faithful supporters for so long. I'm so grateful for this church. Guys like uh, Pastor Corey and Pastor Wayne and John, every, everybody, the whole team, I can't name everybody, but you guys have just an incredible church and great leaders, and it's been an honor to serve alongside of them over the last couple of years. Um, guys, here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna ask you to all to stand with me for just a moment, if you could stand up. I am going to read for us our passage today, and the reason why I'm asking you to stand, it's in honor of Jesus' final command and his words to us right before he went to be with the Father in heaven. These were his marching orders. This wasn't the great opinion. <laughs> this wasn't, you know, some good advice that if you kind of maybe want to, this is what we need to focus on. This was the great commission and his final command to us as his disciples. It's in Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to start in verse 16 and go to verse 20. And just listen closely to this. And, and I want you to think about, are you personally obeying this? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some still doubted. Even after the resurrection, friends, some still doubted. But Jesus came and said to them, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let me pray over you, and then we can have a seat and we'll get into the message. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us clear direction. You didn't beat around the bush here. You didn't make it difficult to understand you made our marching orders very clear that we are called to go make disciples of all nations, all people, all tribes, all tongues, all languages. And so, Father, today in this church, Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and we ask that you'd fill us. We ask that you give us boldness. We ask that you give us courage. We ask that it would be your words that are spoken today, Father, that you would speak through me and that your words would be heard, that you would give us ears to hear and feet that would go and obey. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you and worship you, and we thank you for the honor it is and the privilege it is to join you in the work of seeing disciples made of all nations. We love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Go make disciples. Can I tell you, can I tell you a dirty secret of the mission field? The same guy you are when you get on the plane is the same guy you are when you get off the plane. <laughs> and for me, 15 and a half years ago, that was a problem, okay? I had done a lot of ministry, I'd preached a lot of sermons, I'd served a lot of people, but I had never obeyed this verse in my life. I had never made a disciple, Okay? I had never been made a disciple and I had never made disciples. And so I showed up in India, okay, realizing that I had no idea what I was doing. And now here's the problem, okay? L let me explain it this way. Um, the conscience that God puts inside of us sometimes is attached to tradition or to our parents' commands rather than being attached to the word of God, okay? And that's what had happened to me. I was raised in a, in a Christian home, and from the time I was like negative nine months old, my mother taught me certain things that were good and certain things that were bad, you know what I mean? And so I felt guilty about certain things if I did them or did not do them. So for example, if I did not attend church on Sunday, I felt super guilty about that. You been there? You know, you wake up, it's about 11 a.m., you're like, oh man, all this guilt floods your soul because you're not there, okay? 
I felt guilty if I would curse or if I'd say something bad, if a bad word slipped out of my mouth, because my mom always said, right, <laughs> you gotta talk nice. And so if I accidentally said something, which by the way, I've got a funny story that I was preaching at a conference once and something slipped out of my mouth on stage. <laughs> I'm glad my mama wasn't there for that one, okay? I would feel guilty if I said something wrong or if I saw something wrong or if I did something I knew I wasn't supposed to do, right? My conscience had been tied to these things. And those are, that's good. You want to feel bad for certain things and good for certain things, right? But here was the problem for me. Do you know what I had never felt guilty about in my life? <laughs> not making disciples. I never felt bad about that at all. My conscience was not tied to the commands of Jesus. My conscience was tied to what my parents taught me was right and wrong, right? Which again, that's a good thing, friends. I'm not saying that's bad. But at the end of the day, Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, has all authority that we just read and so our conscience needs to be tied to what he says is good and bad, to what he says is right and wrong, to what he says we need to devote our lives to. And as the church in the West, we major on talking about sins of commission, which are sins that you do, right? Like don't do this and don't do that and don't do these things, right? Because if you do this, it's sinful. And we're really good about tying our conscience to sins of commission, doing the wrong thing. Do you know what we're really bad at? <laughs> tying our conscience to sins of omission, not doing the things we should do. You understand what I'm saying? So for example, in this passage, Jesus is super clear with his command to us as a church, I want you to go, and what do we do? We stay, okay? I want you to go, we stay, we're comfortable, okay? I want you to go do what? Make disciples. What have we done? We make believers, we make church attenders, we make tithers, we, we, we make greeters at the door. All these things are great, okay? But we have forgotten, many of us, the main focus and command that Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, as a, as a church planter, Jesus never even told me to go plant churches. Even though those are good, churches are great, but he didn't say that. He said, go make disciples, and when you make disciples, you get good churches. But we do the opposite. We plant a church, and sometimes we may get a couple disciples. You know what I mean? And so for me, friends, 15 years ago, when I moved to India, I realized that, number one, I had never made a disciple in my life, and my conscience was not tied to the word of God. It was tied to many other things that were good things, but just not to him. Number two, and this was a bigger problem for me, not only had I never made a disciple, but I personally was not even a disciple worth reproducing anyway. Even if I wanted to go make disciples, my life was not being lived in such a way that if, I, if people copied the way I was living, it would have been a good thing. It, I, I wasn't living that way. The last thing India needed 15 years ago was for a couple hundred Josh Howards to be running around. That's the last thing they needed. You can ask my wife. She'll tell you right now today that's the last thing they need, right? Let me ask you a question that God put on my heart many years ago. If everyone in this church prayed the way that you pray, fasted like you fast, shared the gospel as often as you share the gospel, love the way that you love, serve the way that you serve, talk the way you talk, love your spouse the way that you love your spouse, take care of your kids the way that you take care of your kids, right? Take care of their kids the way you take care of your kids. Would that be a good thing for this church or not? Would your city be miraculously transformed or horribly asleep? For me, 15 and a half years ago, friends, my life was not worth reproducing. I talked a good talk, but I did not walk a very good walk. And if people began to live like I lived, it would not have been a good thing for the church. And so friends, as, as we're gonna talk about going and making disciples, it's got to start right here in our own hearts, in our own lives. Number one, are you a disciple worth reproducing? Are you a disciple worth spreading? worth multiplying. Now, please do not hear me wrong, okay? I wanna make something super clear right up front. What I am not saying is that your life needs to be perfect and all your ducks in a row before you start making disciples. That's not what I'm saying. 
As a matter of fact, you don't need to be all perfect and, and everything in line to start making disciples. You just need to be one or two steps ahead of the person behind you. That's it, okay? So do not hear me saying, oh, I've got to get everything perfect before I start doing anything. It's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is you've got to start now. What does your life look like? And do you look like Jesus? When I began to pick up this word when I moved to India and I saw the Indian believers' lives and I saw this book, when I looked at the gospels in the book of Acts, I realized their lives looked quite a bit like what I saw in here. There's still failures and difficulties and things like that, but there was a lot of similarities between the life of Jesus, the life of the disciples, and the believers in India. But when I looked at my life compared to this book, <laughs> it was very, very different, okay? I mean, I was focused on what I wanted to do, what my dreams were, what my, I was the king of my life, Jesus was not. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's a big question, friends, when we talk about disciple making and being a disciple. Is Jesus truly Lord and King of your life or not? In the West, we love to preach Jesus as Savior. We do not like him very much as King because we are independent. We like to be in control. We like to make our own decisions. We like to spend money the way we want. We like to go where we want and do what we want. Jesus as Savior is awesome. He dies on the cross, his blood washes away sin. I get to go to heaven forever, hallelujah, amen. Story closed, book closed. I've got eternal fire insurance, all is good. Jesus' as king though is about surrender. Jesus as king is about him being in control. Jesus' as king is about having not that little idol on your heart anymore, but that idol getting kicked off and him sitting on the throne of your heart, that is not easy. Accepting him as savior is easy. Accepting him as king is hard. But friends, let me tell you a very clear truth that the Indian believers taught me. He is either savior and king or neither. You cannot have him as savior and not also as Lord. You cannot have him as savior and not also have him as king. He is one and the same. You can't divide him into those two things. Are we obeying what he's called us to do or not? I love what Francis Chan says. He gives a great illustration that I've talked about a lot. You know, because we're really good about knowing the right stuff. You know what I mean? Like we read this book, we listen to sermons, we, we know a lot of stuff. But if we're gonna shift from being a believer to a disciple who makes disciples, we've gotta shift from knowledge to obedience and actually doing it. Not just knowing the right stuff, but doing the right stuff. Francis tells the story, he, he says, what if I went home one day, we had guests coming home that night, and I told my daughter, hey, I need you to go clean your room, we've got uh, guests coming, go clean your room. I'm gonna come back in a couple hours. So Francis goes to the store, comes back a couple hours later. What if his daughter met him at the door and said something like this? Dad, you're not gonna believe this. I memorized what you said, go clean your room. <laughs> I can say it. Baby, did you clean your room? No, but I memorized it, isn't that awesome? <laughs> I can even say it in Greek, Dad. <laughs> I don't care what you can say it in. How about you go do what I told you to do, right? And then what if she said, actually, dad, I was gonna call a few of my friends over and we were gonna sit in my room and we were gonna talk about what we thought you meant when you said, go clean your room. Ever been to a Bible study like that? <laughs> no, I mean, as a parent, you would flip out. I mean, all you want them to do is to go do what you said. It doesn't need to be complicated. We don't need to overcomplicate this. We don't need to parse the syllables. We've just got to go do what he said. Go clean your room. That's it. Listen, in the West, we are so good, okay? And I have been so good my whole life at having the right answers and knowing the right verses and all these things, but not actually living it out. And so as believers... Are we filled with knowledge but not actually doing what this book tells us to do? Are we living like Jesus or just talking about it? Many of us talk a great talk, but our walk is severely lacking. Are we making disciples? 
Are we doing what he said to do? Friends, when I moved to India 15 and a half years ago, I met men and women that were the most faithful, loving Christians I'd ever met in my life. And I'd never seen love and faithfulness like that. And so they're the ones that helped me realize, man, my life, is, it, it, there's so much more that needs to happen in this heart of mine. There's so much more that needs to happen in this life of mine. I mean, I met these 16, 17 year old kids that said yes to Jesus, knowing that they were going to get kicked out of their villages, kicked out of their families, and they said yes to Jesus anyway. They were the sell everything you have and buy the field kind of people. You know what I mean? I met pastors that had been beaten within an inch of their life. I'm talking severely beaten in the hospital for days and weeks, and they got out of the hospital and went back and started preaching again. Like, what, what kind of love and dedication is that? I met women that were raped for their faith, and two weeks later were preaching in the same village about this Jesus that we worship. Friends, listen to me. I wish I could tell you story after story of what God has done through these Indian believers, but here's what I want you to hear, okay? When I met these men and women, I'd never seen love like that. I'd never seen faithfulness like that. I'd never seen boldness like that. And their love for Jesus made my love for Jesus look a whole lot more like liking Jesus. You get what I'm, you get what I'm saying? So for the first few years, I started, I was doing ministry, but I was learning a lot from these Indian believers about what it means to follow Jesus. I still have a long way to go. My life is still a mess in many different areas. My wife will be the first one to tell you. <laughs> you can ask her later. But the Indian believers have changed my life. And as I've watched them and live with them, being dedicated and faithful to be a disciple who makes disciples, they have challenged me to be a better man, to be a better husband, to be a better father, and to live this life that God has called me to live. And friends, today, I wanna challenge you in that same way. Is your conscience tied to the word of God or to, or to the traditions of men? And are you a disciple worth reproducing? Okay? But again, to start this process, I want you to know, okay, you don't have to be perfect. You just need to be a couple steps ahead. I have a mentor of mine that calls it duckling discipleship, okay? And this is what he says. Picture, picture a mama duck and all of her little baby ducklings. Have you seen this, right? They're all in a single file line. The mama duck's up front leading the pack, and then every other little duckling is just waddling along behind. Here's the truth of that. The first little duckling is really the only one following the mama. Every other little duckling is just following the one right in front of it. You get what I'm saying? And so to make a disciple, you don't need to be mama duck with everything you know, perfect. You just need to be the little duckling one or two steps ahead of the one behind you. That's it, okay? We don't need to overcomplicate it. Do you know how to pray a little bit? You can teach somebody who's never prayed how to pray. Do you know how to read the Bible and study it a little bit? You can teach somebody how to study it a little bit. Do you know how to share your testimony? You can teach somebody else how to share their testimony. Do you know how to share a little gospel tool like the three circles that you guys use or something else? You can teach somebody else how to do that. That's what disciple making looks like, friends. It's just being the little duck a couple steps ahead. That's it. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna take the next few minutes to tell you a couple of stories from the New Testament about how God can use anybody in order to see this happen. The title of this message in the series that you're in is From This to That. It's talking about going from a traveler to a guide. A traveler to a guide. Now a traveler, if you think about this, usually is really only concerned about them getting to the destination and probably enjoying the journey a little bit on the way. But a guide goes a little bit slower. They're constantly looking back, making sure everyone else is on the path, that they're safe and sound. They warn them of dangers ahead. That's what a guide does. That's what disciple making looks like. Now, when I first heard this guide thing, I thought, well, you know what, to be a guide, I mean, you've really had to do this path like hundreds of times and you need to know the final destination and all that. But then as I began to research, you really don't. You just need to, know the, you need to know the terrain a little bit. You need to make sure you're looking ahead and making sure everybody else is behind and you actually go slower than you would by yourself and, and you just kind of continue to guide them along the path, that's it. 
And so right now, guys, over the next few minutes, as I talk about this, I'm gonna show you a few people that immediately went from traveler in their life to guide to help other people. And here's the cool thing about being a disciple-making guide. People don't really need to follow you. You just gotta point them to Jesus. That's it. Huh? <laughs> you just gotta point them to Jesus. Like, Jesus is the one we're following. He's the mama duck. You know, I don't think he'd like that, but he's the mama duck, okay? Sorry, Lord. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm sure I'll get to heaven and I'll be like, Josh, I didn't like that illustration very much, you know? <laughs> anyway, he's the mama duck, Okay? And we just gotta point people to him. You guys know the Samaritan woman? You've heard this story, I'm sure. The woman at the well, you remember this? This woman was standing by herself. She was ashamed. The Bible says that she had had five husbands and the man she was currently living with was not her husband. And back in those days, I mean, that was a huge, huge issue. Way, way, way bigger than it would be now. Some people still would frown upon that now, but back then it was like, I mean, game over. No one would even be around her or talk to her. She had so much shame. She had to go in the middle of the day to the well without any other women around. And there she was. Jesus begins to talk to her and give her hope. Jesus touches her life. He begins to share with her. He was not culturally even supposed to be talking to her in public, friends. It was, it, it was a horrible, horrible cultural faux pas of Jesus to talk to this woman. But Jesus will break any culture to bring in kingdom culture. He talks to her. He loves her. He encourages her. He begins to wipe away the shame. He begins to wipe away the pain. He begins to show her that everything's gonna be okay. And then do you know what happens? For her whole life, she had been a traveler. She had been worried about probably herself, feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, wondering what everybody was whispering about her as she walked on. She was on this journey of life alone. And then Jesus came along, radically transformed her life, and set her on a new path. And do you know what she did immediately? <laughs> This woman ran into the village that she had been rejected by, that she had been pushed away from, ran into the village and started telling everybody, come and see this Jesus who told me everything I'd ever done. Come and see him. What's she doing? As a guide now, she is pointing to the Savior and trying to get everybody to come along with her. Amen? And this woman radically transforms her entire village. Nobody would have picked her, man. You know what I mean? Nobody would, expected, would have expected that this was the woman that would have changed a village. But Jesus can use anybody. If you surrender your little life to him, it's like the little boy with you know, the, the fish and the bread. You know what I mean? He, he's got nothing, man. He can't feed thousands of people, but he offers it up to Jesus and Jesus takes it and multiplies it. That's exactly what he did with this woman. This woman had nothing that that village would have wanted, but what she did have was an encounter with Jesus that she could point people to. You do too, friends. You do too. Offer that, <laughs> those loaves and fishes up, man. Offer that broken life up and Jesus will use it and transform multitudes with it. If God can use her, he can use you. Or what about the gathering demoniac in the book of Mark? You know the story? Jesus, you remember he, he calmed a storm and then he got off the boat and all of a sudden there's this crazy naked guy that runs at him. Can you imagine? I mean, don't imagine that, okay? But, but but seriously, like, it's, it's crazy. Like, and by the way, if nobody would have picked this guy, are you serious? Like, if you're looking for your next elder at Northside, are you gonna pick the crazy naked homeless guy? Like, that's, it's not who you're gonna go with, you know? That's not choice number one, maybe number two, but not number one, you know what I mean? Like, this guy, but Jesus saw something different. See, Jesus doesn't look at all the muck and the pain and the, and the brokenness. He looks past all of that to see a lost child of God that desperately needed his touch. Friends, do you know that one touch from Jesus can change everything? One word from his mouth changes everything. Amen? 
Guys, let me take a minute here. I, I know we're talking a lot about being a disciple who makes disciples, but listen, some of you in this room have come in here with baggage and pain and difficulty. This guy literally had hundreds of demons inside of him. Some scholars believe thousands of demons were inside of this guy. He had baggage like crazy, brokenness. The woman that we talked about had all this shame. Whatever you've come in here with, whatever addiction, whatever pain, whatever brokenness, here's what I want you to know, that one touch from our Savior today will change everything in your life. And that Savior is here in this room, and he's ready to touch you and set you free. So do not walk back out these doors with whatever baggage or brokenness you have. Come to him today. I'll be that guide for you. I'm pointing to the cross. I'm pointing to Jesus, and I'm saying, just go to him, man, and everything's going to be okay. So this is what happens. This crazy, demon-possessed guy, Jesus, one word, casts out every single demon from this guy's life. Every chain, every addiction, every demon, every piece of evil, it's all gone from the, from the voice of our Savior, evil must flee. And all of a sudden, this guy's life is transformed. He's sitting fully clothed, thank God, at the feet of Jesus. And then the people get scared. They're like, Jesus, like, <laughs> you can't stay here. You just threw all these demons into pigs. The pigs died like it was crazy, you know? And Jesus, like the gentleman he is, he left. He's not going to force himself. You know, sometimes when Jesus does something unexpected, we push him away rather than open our arms. You know what I mean? And that's what they did that day. They pushed him away. So Jesus turns around, gets on the boat, and the demon-possessed guy, well, I guess I should call him the man formerly known as the demon-possessed guy. He's been radically changed, comes after Jesus. He says, Jesus, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, no. What? No. I thought this was the Jesus who says, come and follow me, right? Like, drop your nuts, come and be with me. No, 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 this is what Jesus says. He says, no, I want you to go back home. I want you to go to your family and your friends, and I want you to tell them what God has done for you today. Jesus takes him from a traveler, a broken, selfish traveler, to a guide who transforms lives for a living. This is what the Bible says. That guy went to preach to the Decapolis. Deca means 10. It was a region of 10 cities, not towns, not villages, cities. This man who literally like 10 minutes before was crazy, naked, and demon-possessed with one touch from Jesus sends him out and he becomes a preacher to 10 different cities. He didn't know anything, man. He didn't have all the knowledge. He hadn't studied the Torah. All he knew was that this man, Jesus, radically changed his life, and he started to point everybody he could to him. Amen? Amen. Guys, listen. If God can use that guy, he can use you. I mean, you're one step ahead. All of you came in here clothed. Thank you for that, by the way, you know? None of you are rolling around the floor, frothing at the mouth, you know, like you, you're, you're pretty good, you know, you got, you know, life might be a little messy sometimes, but it's definitely not this guy, you know what I mean? Like you are one or two steps ahead of this guy. If God can use him, he can use you. And so please don't make any excuses like, oh, I'm not trained or I don't know what to do or this or that. Friends, listen to me. You, at the end of your life, will stand before Jesus alone, and you will be held accountable for what you did based upon what he said. Not what your pastor did, not what your leader did, not what your church did. It will just be you. And today, friends, Jesus is calling you to join him in this great work of making disciples who multiply. Friends, will you obey? There is no greater task in the world to give our lives to than to see lives transformed for all of eternity. The only thing that will last forever are the souls of the men and women around you. That's it. Your money, your boats, your lake house, your cars, your, your 401k, whatever, your Roth IRA, whatever it is, all these things that I don't have any of as a missionary, you know what I mean? Like all those things are not gonna last, friends. Like, we will not take any of it with us. The only thing that will go with us in eternity are the souls of the people around us that we bring with us. The people that you can guide to the Savior's feet. That's all that will last. 
There is nothing more important in this world than this task that Jesus is giving us. The call, friends, is clear, and the work is so urgent. If God can use that Samaritan woman, if God can use that demon-possessed guy, and friends, if God could use a guy like me, I don't have time to tell my whole story, but listen, I come from a very broken past. My dad left when I was four. I lived with my grandparents. My grandpa, who became my dad, died of brain cancer when I was 16. A month later, my aunt, who uh, was married to my uncle, who was my youth minister, was arrested for having sexual relations with a kid in our youth group, okay? A month after my grandpa died, my mom became a closet alcoholic because she lost her dad and her sister-in-law and her brother all at once, okay? And so at 16, I was left alone and very, very broken. I was addicted to all sorts of junk. I was not living the life that God called me to live. And listen to me, friends, the father came into my life and radically, radically changed everything. And he put me on a new, with a new purpose. And now I can stand before you today talking about thousands of churches and thousands of people coming to Christ. And it's only because the father God became the father that I never had. And friends, if God can use me out of that broken mess, I know that he can use you. If he can use that Samaritan woman with all of her shame, he can use you. And if God can use that demon-possessed guy with literally thousands of demons inside of him, he can use you. Stop making excuses. It's time to live the life that God has called you to live. The day is now. The time is now. The harvest, friends, is ripe. Jesus promised us the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. There's not enough people going. There's plenty of people staying. Will you be a disciple who goes and makes disciples? Friends, I'm gonna have the band come out in just a minute. And we're gonna sing a song together. And I'm gonna ask you to really look deep in your heart today. Are you a disciple who is making disciples? Are you obeying Jesus' final command to us to go? And friends, listen to me. I'm serious here. I don't care if you go across the street or across the ocean. There are people everywhere who desperately need the gospel. There are people right here in Springfield that if they heard a clear presentation of the gospel today, they would say, yes, the harvest is ready. But the workers are so, so few. And so friends, today, will you be the answer to God's call on the planet, will you be a disciple who makes disciples? I'm gonna pray over you right now, and then we're gonna sing, and I'm gonna ask if you wanna make a decision today, I'm gonna be over at the decision point with a few other people, please come over there and surrender your life today as Jesus being King, Lord, and Savior of your life, and become a disciple worth multiplying, become a disciple who makes more disciples. Let's pray, friends. Jesus, thank you for your call on our lives. Thank you for the amazing opportunity and privilege that you've given us to join you in the work of literally transforming lives. There is no greater work that we could give our lives to. And so as we go to work, as we go to school, I pray that you would put your words on our lips, that you would give us your hands and your feet, and that we would be obedient to do what you've called us to do, that we wouldn't just talk about it anymore. We wouldn't just attend church, but we would be the church. We wouldn't just talk about your will, but we would fulfill your will on the planet. Lord, make us world changers, nation shakers. Light a fire in us that would spread so that every man, woman, and child has an opportunity to hear your word. I pray your boldness and courage over every man, woman, and child here. I pray that every chain of addiction would be broken and that you would bring healing and power to them right now in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.